Thank you. Everyone has a story to tell, and we are hardwired to do so. Stories often speak to our basic human drives and weaknesses. They capture our attention, and they make us feel things such as empathy, curiosity, surprise, and or fear. When we hear stories, there are chemical changes in our brains. Cortisol sharpens our attention, boosts strength and speed, and it engages us. O rises in oxytocin is reportedly seen when humans feel close to each other. Even seeing fictional characters ca interact can have this effect. This is my Nana. Her, her name was Violet Sophia. Let me tell you a little of her story. She had her first child out of wedlock, waited till she was pregnant with her second child to marry the children's father. Her story became more interesting when I tell you, in 1936, having done her own private eye work to discover her husband was having adulterous in relations, she divorced him and married his younger brother. <laughs> My nana held the purse strings tightly and always managed all of the finances. She was sharp as a tack until her last breath and her final words were, you will have to pay the gas bill. <laughs> My nana was profoundly deaf and as a result, she spoke very, very loudly. We were at a social function and my nana had already done one of her party tricks of showing her very grotesque mastectomy scar to a complete stranger. <laughs> but imagine me as an innocent 15 year old when Violet, apropos of nothing, openly, loudly broadcasted to me how she loved sex. <laughs> always had, always would. She went into way more detail than I can recall because I became <laughs> catatonic from mortification. <laughs> so I suspect you can feel for me as that cringing teenager and you're surprised because you didn't expect me to say that about my nana. <laughs> Another thing that has happened is that Violet lives on as her story is told. They say you die twice, once when you stop breathing and the second a bit later on when someone mentions your name for the last time. Although not all people care about leaving a legacy, many do, do want to create something that will outlive them. It is argued that this human urge may be to reduce the fear of death, which is associated with the fear of being forgotten or of being nothing. Generally, legacy can be defined as something received from a predecessor. It may be genetic material, possessions, money, or stories. And thinking about our legacy may remind us of death, but it's really about life and living. Blogger Sharon Smith states it is about putting our life into perspective, making conscious choices about the kind of life we want to live and the legacy we wish to have behind, leave behind. She argues as we live our life, we are continuously creating a personal legacy and sh we should reflect on how do we want to be remembered? Smith suggests we ponder, what will people think of me if I died today? She asked a couple of people close to her to help her with her list of five things. My favourite of which was, Sharon was a smoker and no doubt that shortened her life. <laughs> Working with patients with life-limiting illness provides us with the opportunity to encourage our patients to create legacies and that some need our assistance to do so. People can capture their stories in things like traditional photo albums, digital albums, life story writing, video recordings, and letters. There's a Record Me Now app, which is a free app for leaving, leaving a loving legacy. One can record video interviews on personal subjects. There is associated research, which is focused on the children of people who've died from MND and discovering what information they would have liked to know about their parents. Parents have an especially potent reason to capture information about their lives. They may be the only ones to know information about their children, first words or what the birth was like, or th things that kids may want to know about their parents, such as the name of the parents' perfume or aftershave. One mum who was raised in a very, very abusive family wrote in her biography, renaming her children. Oops.
We decided not to having any of the nonsense of being named after someone in the family. We decided our children would have a name unique to them. There was a fuss when we told the family because they thought Aaron should have been named after my father, who died 10 years earlier on the same day Aaron was born. I'm so glad with our decision all those years ago. This patient specifically asked me to spread the word about how important legacies are. And she asked her own name to be used because she said it's the only name, it's her name and it's, she wanted her story connected with her name. Sometimes people want to share their story to teach something and one of our patients with MND used our volunteer biography service to write his experience about being discharged, with, sorry, being diagnosed with MND and to share the experience for the benefit of others. When he presented to our community palliative care team, he was being cared for by his devoted wife. As his disease progressed, he requested to move into a nursing home to save his wife, who had another fully dependent family member to care for. When the nursing home staff read his biography, it changed the way they cared for him. He became a man with a whole life, not the MND patient who could only communicate with eye movement. The family reported staff treated him more gently and would chat about the things he'd mentioned in his biography while they cared for him. His intention was to benefit others by teaching. It was an unexpected outcome that in doing so, he also benefited. One of my terminally ill patients was a single mum of a preschooler. She herself was adopted. The child's father was unknown and leaving her own daughter to grow up with no blood relatives as she had was an unfathomable grief. She was concerned that her words would be diluted over the years and her daughter was too young to remember them for herself. I helped her write a letter to her daughter and about how she loved her and what she hoped for her. This was presented in a digital photo book which is archival quality and is supposed to last a hundred years. Multiple copies were made and distributed to different friends and fa family excuse me, members to ensure longevity. This mum wrote, I'm kind and caring and so are you. I know you'll have the cold people in your life just as I have had. Way before MasterChef, people left recipes as their legacy. One of our patients wrote this recipe and it sounds just as she spoke. And I love the fact that she started off by where she bought the rice <laughs> and the specific brand. And if you're a Northern Beaches person, you'd know the DY Indian shop. Oops. For those of you interested, you can scan the QR scan because I have on Dropbox some more information and some of the tools that I use to inspire people. Those of you who are thinking of tackling your own, organising your photos and jotting down those treasured family memories when you retire, think about how many of our patients had the same plan. Any information one captures in any form will make a difference in some way. Start small, start soon, one photo, one client at a time. I encourage you to just start one favourite photo, write why you love it, when it was taken, who is in it and how you feel when you look at it. The process can be as important as the end product. It can be very joyous for people as they're submerged in memories for a time when illness was not a dominant feature in their life. This process may help people start conversations with people they love in different ways. Think about how you want to be remembered. Maybe it's for your love of sex, your cooking, or your fantastic work with MND people. Passion is contagious, and when we start on our own legacy, it's easier to inspire your clients to do the same. Leaving stories in some form is an important, priceless legacy. Just begin. Whatever medium you choose, the product will be surprisingly meaningful to yourself and who knows who in time to come.